Very good. Good, um, good afternoon. Good evening, everybody, wherever you are in the world. Um, uh, thank you for joining us. Um, for those who I don't know, I'm Sandra Galea. I have the privilege of serving as Dean of School of Public Health at Boston University, and welcome to one of our signature programs. Uh, today, we are um, featuring uh, the book by Professor Mohammed Zaman called The Biography of Resistance, the Epic, epic ba Battle Between People and Pathogens. As uh, I have told, I've told Professor Zaman offline, it's uh, hard to think of a book with a better title than the epic battle between people and pathogens at a time of COVID-19. The um, Professor Zaman's book really is all about the uh, forces of antibiotic resistance and how, and how those, those forces are created by societal decisions that contribute to a developing public health crisis, which to my mind really captures very well what's happening right now around COVID. So today we're really, really honored to have Professor Zaman speaking about his book, but about the topic more broadly. By way of introduction, Professor Zaman is Howard Hughes Medical Institute Professor of Biomedical Engineering and International Health here at Boston University. His research focuses on three areas, quantitative tools to understand tumor metastases, robust technologies for high value healthcare problems in uh, low income countries, and working on health and innovation, innovative policy issues in low income countries. He has won numerous awards for research and teaching. He is named Howard Hughes Professor by the Howard Hughes Medical Institute and was elected a fellow of the American Institute of Biological and Medical Engineering. He contributes regularly to a broad range of publications on issues of drug quality control, global health in uh, both the academic press as well as in the public press. And on a personal note, he is a valued colleague and friend and someone from whom I have learned tremendously. We also have with us as our moderator today, Karen Weintraub. Karen is a long-standing distinguished health and science journalist covering the biological sciences. She has contributed to places like New York Times, Washington Post, Scientific American, NPR, etc. Recently, uh, Karen has now become uh, uh, working full-time at USA Today, where she's covering a range of health issues, including, of course, but not limited to uh, issues around COVID and the COVID vaccine. So the format of today, we've asked Professor Zaman to speak first. He will speak, as I said, a little bit about his book, but broadly speaking about the topic at hand. And then uh, when he finishes speaking, Karen is going to take over and she will uh, lead a Q&A with Professor Zaman. She will ask him some questions for, for a bit, and then we'll take questions from the audience to really engage a broader conversation. I'm really excited about today. I'm really excited about what we shall learn in the next hour, hour and a half. Mohammed, over to you. Thank you so much, uh, Sandro. Thank you, Karen, and, and many colleagues from all over the world who join us today. Um, it's, it's really an honor and a privilege, not only because um, I'm humbled by the opportunity to speak, but also the forum um, is uh, something that, that I deeply uh, admire a place which has given me plenty to think, plenty to reflect. And Sandro is, is not just a colleague and a, a friend, but also a mentor in many ways. Um, I'll share my screen. Uh, my slides are non-technical in nature. They're also designed for a conversation. They're about uh, the book, uh, but also about lessons that I learned while writing the book. Um, and, and perhaps things that we can, we can all think about in the time that we live in and hopefully for a better time in the future. So let me get my screen. So um, the way the book is structured, it's a story of how we got where we are today. Uh, it's a story about people. It's a story certainly about pathogens, but more about human behavior. Um, and, and uh, sort of a holding myself and all of us um, to a level where we can look in the mirror and recognize what we did right and plenty that we did not do right. Um, somebody asked me many times, uh, so people have asked me many times, uh, why would I write a book? Um, and, I'll, and I'll talk about that. But the question I think we should all answer is, why shouldn't at this point in time, we engage 
broadly with each other, uh, with um, people who may have certain views about science, certain views about health. And I think that the time is uh, particularly important to really reflect on what can science tell us, but also about the lessons from the history of science. So before I start, I wanna talk about uh, another moment in time, the great 1918 pandemic and how that really played a role in shaping certainly Boston, but also many other parts of the world. At that time, um, a country that I was born in, Pakistan did not exist. It was a British colony uh, of India and one of the prominent leaders of the uh, sort of uh, anti-colonial movement was uh, Mr. Gandhi. He was uh, affected by the pandemic. So it was Mustafa Kemal, the founder of modern Turkey. And so was T.S. Eliot. Um, who wrote the very famous poem, Baseland, based on his experiences in the pandemic. The reason I bring this up is that it was something that really touched lives all over the world. In India, about 40% of all fatalities uh, from the 1918 pandemic were actually in India. Uh, we're talking here about people who were in tens of millions. And I, I hope uh, that we do not get anywhere close to that number, anywhere in India or elsewhere but it really was a pivotal moment. The reason I bring that up today is because of a paper um, that hasn't gotten as much attention as it should um, about 10 years ago. The title of the paper was Predominant Role of Bacterial Pneumonia as a Cause of Death in Pandemic Influenza. In other words, it was not just a viral disease. It was also a bacterial infection right in the sort of uh, wings of the viral infection. And look at the names of the authors. The third author, Anthony S. Fauci, somebody who we've seen uh, on television, somebody who we continue to trust and somebody who's getting a lot of flack recently, unfortunately, um, from, from, uh, from the current administration. But the story is actually quite remarkable. Looking at uh, preserved tissue samples, doctor's reports, even diaries of clinicians. Professor Fauci and others really pieced together a remarkable story that was actually a combination of virus and bacteria that really, really sort of wreaked havoc. A similar story appeared not too long after uh, Dr. Fauci's paper, this time by a different set of authors. The reason I bring it up is for two um, sort of, um, Factor. The first factor is that it would be naive to think that the current pandemic would be over if we have the problems, or if we deal with the vital problems alone. The bacterial problems may be lurking just next to the vital challenges. And the second one is that if something like this were to happen, we would have antibiotics. But that answer actually is partially incomplete. With increasing antibiotic resistance, and increasing bacterial infections that may just be lurking in the shadows here, we may be dealing with a problem that is significantly bigger than what we have estimated so far. So even in the great um, Spanish flu of uh, 1918, 1919, that killed tens of millions of people, the role of bacterial infection was significant. And that might uh, again be happening in the near future if we are not paying attention to what is going on. So let me answer the first question. So why do I write? You know, um, as an academic, um, writing is a central part of and a central piece of our mission, but writing for a broad public audience is different. Um, for me, it's an opportunity to engage with people, uh, people who I may not engage in my uh, professional society meetings or in my sort of study sections or in the lectures or in the classroom, my neighbors my daughter's teacher, my aunts and uncles, people who I may know casually or personally. And, and I want to sort of engage with them and I want to learn from them and I hope I can contribute to that as well, particularly at this moment in time. There's another reason that I write. Writing to me is not just a part of scholarly experience or a part of scholarship, but good writing that I hope and aspire that I will be able to do uh, 
perhaps in the future, is a form of art. For me, it's an opportunity to combine scholarship, science, and art together. And the third reason is, um, I think, which is an important one, academic writing uh, does a phenomenal job in conveying results and, and data and uh, making a case based on evidence. But it is written in a way with a particular reviewer in mind, with people who may sort of object to the argument and sort of you back it up with references. And oftentimes it loses that narrative arc that allows the writer to engage, to tell a story, certainly with facts, certainly with evidence, but in a way that would appeal to a broader audience. And a book allows you to do that a lot more than academic paper does. And that's another reason that I find writing to be a very meaningful experience and a very sort of an important experience in my overall set of activities. So the story of antibiotic resistance is a story of all of us, but I want to sort of take the moment to tell about things that I found quite unusual, things perhaps that some of us may know or may have seen, but may not have really paid attention to. About a year ago, um, on 13th of September, 2019, this was the Google Doodle. It was about a man from Copenhagen, an unassuming man who happened to be in Germany, the sort of uh, center of research activity in the late 19th century, and ended up doing something quite remarkable. His name is associated, even to this date, with bacteria in a remarkable way. Anybody who starts with microbiology or wants to work in bacteriology oftentimes starts with a basic classification of bacteria, gram positive or gram negative. His name was Hans Christian Gram. And he was just a remarkable individual, an unassuming doctor, a physician, whose claim to fame by that time was that his advisor said he spoke German very well, but with a Danish accent. The book is full of stories about these people who have really allowed us to think, who've really made tremendous contribution, people who we shouldn't forget, but people whose contribution lives on. A significant part of the book is sort of challenging the notions about people, about our understanding, about uh, behavior, about events. Among the people who have made tremendous, tremendous contribution to science are two um, academic arch rivals from two different parts of the um, sort of scholarship, but both of them just absolutely uh, phenomenal scientists to a great extent. One is Louis Pasteur uh, on the left, and the other one is Robert Koch on the right. But they were not perfect human beings. They were not demigods. In fact, both of them had tremendous failings. Pasteur's work on vaccines for the early part was actually just a fraud. He had no idea how to make vaccines. And we know this from his own diaries that were released about 70 years after his death. Koch's work in German East Africa, which is the present day uh, Uganda and Tanzania, was deeply troubling, where people were forcibly recruited for his uh, medicine, Atoxyl, um, which was extremely toxic that he used for sleeping sickness, and it did nothing except cause blindness in these people who were subjected to sort of colonial torture. And it's important for all of us to read this history so that we can be better ourselves. Many of the contributions of Pasteur and Koch will live on forever, and we all need to recognize them for that. But we all need to also recognize that in history, these great men were not perfect. Speaking of other people who are important characters, people who, may, who, may, who we may have forgotten by now, on the left-hand side is Frederick Tward, the person who discovered bacteriophages. In the middle is Felix Derel, the person who really popularized phages to the point that Sinclair wrote a book about him and got the Pulitzer Prize. Phages were sort of the uh, flavor du jour, so to speak, in the 1920s and early 1930s before they were no longer sort of the talk of the town. Partly, not completely, but partly because they became the Soviet medicine and got associated with this man, Joseph Stalin, who wanted to use that as an opportunity to create sort of medicine, a more sort of uh, 
proletarian uh, medicine, uh, more sort of anti-imperial medicine. And with all of that, uh, of course, there was a lot of politics and antibiotics became more prominent at that time. Phages are now back in um, sort of, um, they're the flavor du jour now again, and they have tremendous promise as well. And the institute that Stalin started in his home of Georgia still lives on. Alexander Fleming was a remarkable scientist, um, a person who is credited with the discovery of penicillin, uh, a person not only who discovered penicillin, but also sort of really was among the first people to talk about the potential dangers of abuse or misuse of penicillin. By the way, the book talks about the, the great story of him leaving the window open and sort of the, the uh, sort of the mold and disappearing, that story actually wasn't quite true. Only parts of it um, were true and historians now know that unfortunately some of that story was made up. He indeed discovered penicillin, but the window part wasn't quite right. But, but uh, the reason Fleming is remarkable is not just because of his discovery, but because also he really sort of was among the first clarion callers of this problem. And he did that at one of the greatest points in his own career during the um, Nobel Prize acceptance speech. It's a really remarkable speech and, and you should certainly read about it. So in 1945, right after the war, penicillin is sort of this really greatest thing that has done tremendous service to the victory of the United States and, and her allies. And here is a man who discovered penicillin and says, well, be careful. And he didn't pay attention. But what had actually started happening even before um, Penicillin was another drug, sulfur drugs, that were before penicillin, the, the greatest blockbuster of the time. And they saved the life of somebody um, who was a prominent person, the son of the president, FDR Jr. But by the time the war was in full swing, Brigadier Elliot Cutler, whose archives are by the way in, in Boston at the Conway Library at Harvard, when he was asked by the British parliamentarians, does the drug work? And he said, no, it doesn't. By the middle of the war, people knew that overuse of antibiotics, in this case, sulfonamides, leads to their impotency. The question one should ask is, why was this call not heated? What exactly was going on? How deep? was the hubris. How deep was our understanding that there'll be new drugs coming at all times? And that's something to think about as we move forward as well. Unfortunately, science has been written in a way that it has become a story of just great men, people who are sort of larger than life characters who really sort of uh, move the mountains and, and, and sort of make great discoveries. And unfortunately, a lot of that is just not true. It's not just great men who do that. First of all, there are plenty of women and I sort of really encountered the remarkable stories and contributions of many of them, but it's also often the system as a whole. And that takes me to this point. Somebody asked me, who is the protagonist of the book? The protagonist of the book is a scientific enterprise. Just like a biography should have a protagonist, there is one here and sort of the ebbs and flows, the highs and lows of the scientific enterprise that I sort of look at where we were and where we are. But now for a few minutes, let's just think about not just these great men that have now become sort of synonymous with science, but sort of a more nuanced and richer look. There were people who were just as remarkable. They were just not these great men. The person whose papers have absolutely learned to love and admire, her name is Professor Mary Barber. She was the first one with precision and excellent prose and clarity talked about penicillin resistance in the UK, just two years after the great speech of Alexander Fleming. Her papers are just a page or two long, have the clearest data that you would have and are written with such sharpness that it leaves a permanent mark on the reader. I really encourage people to read her work. It's, it's just absolutely remarkable. 
And then there were two Australian women, Dr. Phyllis Roundtree and Dr. Claire Espister, who were the first ones to really look at an outbreak of penicillin resistance in their hospitals. Phyllis was, as one of her teachers said, the smartest person he had ever met, smarter than her siblings, smarter than any boys in the classroom. She couldn't find a job because she was a woman, but she persisted. Dr. Claire Espister was the head of pediatrics at Royal North Shore Hospital in Sydney and figured out that it was sort of the behavior of the nurses, the doctors, and the engagement of patients with each other that was leading to this outbreak. The modern mo models of hygiene in pediatric wards and subsequently other wards actually was started by Clarice Bister based on the work of Phyllis Roundtree. I don't know how many hospitals would now be in trouble with COVID if it wasn't because of the early work of uh, these two incredible, incredible physicians. And then at the peak of this um, sort of uh, honeymoon where there was a sense that there'll always be a new drug right, right around the corner. If there's penicillin um, and it's not working, there'll be something else. And that something for some time was methicillin until Patricia Javins came, comes along and says, well, hold on. Methicillin doesn't work quite as well as you thought it would. And thus began, began the story of MRSA, methicillin resistant staph aureus, that continues to be a problem to this day in hospitals, large and small, urban, peri-urban and rural, in countries that are high income and low income. And again, the work of Patricia Javins showed that early on, a little changed. And so goes the story, sort of early calls and no change in behavior. This belief that there will be a new antibiotic coming, there would be a new antibiotic right around the corner. I don't know how much we learned, but that sort of behavior continued for a long, long time. You know, one of the other, so that was the first part that things as if, things that I had learned about people and behaviors, they didn't seem quite what I had been told and what I had been taught. The second thing that was absolutely remarkable um, as I sort of uh, worked in, uh, in many places, spoke to incredible people, worked in archives and in, in, uh, in different countries was how remarkable the story of antibiotic resistance is in both time and in space. In time, the story uh, that I really learned was uh, a story that was uncovered by two scientists, one from University of Akron uh, in Ohio and one from McMaster in, in, in Canada. Um, these two researchers uh, sort of really did something quite remarkable. Um, the story goes that they wanted to figure out um, whether in old ancient caves that have not been touched by human activity, um, would you find bacteria that are resistant to antibiotics? Remember these uh, caves, one of the largest cave systems in New Mexico uh, has been like that for four or five million years. They were discovered in the 1980s and parts of it were just completely untouched. So they scooped up the, the surface, um, and, 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 and by the way, their, their name are, names are Hazel Barton at the top and Jerry Wright at the bottom. So uh, Dr. Barton is um, uh, sort of a cave biologist. He studies the, the behavior of um, uh, sort of species, uh, microbial species in caves. So she goes in into these deep, deep caves and sort of scoops up the, uh, the surface bacteria. And what they found was that these were resistant to some of the leading antibiotics that we find. In other words, this battle between bacteria where one group of bacteria produces antibiotic and another group of bacteria really sort of develops resistance has been going on for millions of years. And that can, that equilibrium can continue and will continue, except for the fact that human activity has tipped the balance. We've put sort of our thumbs on those scales a little bit and really sort of changed that equilibrium, creating these sort of rapid rise in antibiotic resistance. So that's the story in, in, in one story in time. The second story that came in early 2000, um, in, in 2010 and 11 was this remarkable story of the Yanomami tribe uh, who um, sort of this, this group of indigenous population that have lived at the border between Venezuela and Brazil for 
for a millennia or, or, or perhaps more. Um, and these were uncontacted tribes. And the uh, international sort of uh, agreement is that if they are spotted, if they are contacted uh, unintentionally as well, you have to immunize them. So before immunization, um, sort of fecal samples and sort of this dead skin cell samples were collected from this tribe because they were um, sort of seen for the first time by um, a Venezuelan army helicopter. And, and, and uh, it turned out that again, there were sort of um, antibiotic resistance uh, that was seen in these communities. So that tells you really that uh, the problem has really uh, been there for a long period of time, and that's a natural process, a natural process of evolution, as well as tribes that have been uncontacted. There are a number of different theories as to why the Yanomami would show uh, resistance or would have a sort of in their fecal samples resistance uh, bugs with, with resistant genes. Um, some of it is perhaps because of water contamination. Some of it has to do with the fact that they may have uh, been eating um, sort of the, the local uh, sort of fruit that may have uh, some some uh, antibiotic um, sort of efficacy. Uh, but again, we don't know for a fact. A number of genome studies have been done, but it's more of a situational analysis. A complete understanding is still lacking um, in, in that regard. But that just tells you of this remarkable, remarkable sort of story of science and evolution and um, sort of human engagement with the nature. Perhaps an important aspect of antibiotic resistance as we are taught and as we think is why is it happening? And uh, the story goes, or sort of the, the popular narrative goes that you have these people who take antibiotics when they shouldn't, and that's absolutely true. You have people who take antibiotics for shorter period than they should. That's also, there's some merit to that. You have doctors who uh, over prescribe antibiotics when they shouldn't, all of that is true. But there are other reasons as well, reasons that we do not pay enough attention to, reasons that are just as important. And one of them is global conflict. Um, we all know that any time in modern warfare, there is conflict, there is destruction of infrastructure, there is destruction of hospitals, uh, doctors and healthcare workers are targeted, um, waterways get contaminated. And, and, and that's sort of a higher level answer. But then there is, are much more subtle answers as well. For example, the rise of antibiotic resistant Acinetobacter bomani in, um, in early 2000s during the second US uh, led Gulf War, uh, a very, very sharp increase in the development of drug resistant organisms to the point that Congress had to have multiple hearings. Um, and this was something that uh, at that time was really troubling something that we now do not uh, see as much. The sad reality of this whole episode because of war and, and that, and it's important to understand that war is doing multiple things here. So it's destroying infrastructure in hospitals. It's creating infections. It's also taking out these uh, frontline healthcare workers. It's also uh, creating the healthcare system dependent on broad spectrum antibiotics because they can't do any testing but it's also doing something at a mechanistic level. So the metal, the heavy metals present in the, um, in the weapons, in the modern weapons, often would create contaminated waterways or con contaminated environmental sampling, and, and contaminated the environment, environment and samplings from those uh, places have shown increased number of resistant bacteria. But it does something else as well. It creates an ecology and an environment that stays like this for generations. The US forces have largely left Iraq, but in that region, the problem is now endemic. People, kids who weren't even born at that time, when they get infected, there is a high likelihood that they may get infected with a bacteria that is not going to respond to any antibiotics. It was called Iraqi bacter, but it's not just Iraq. A story last year in CNN showed the US defeated Kabul superbugs in its military, but the locals still struggle with antibiotic resistance. And this may be happening in other places as well. Places that are in the crosshairs of conflict. So the issue of antibiotic resistance is not just about bad doctors and bad patients. It's also about our inability to live in peace. 
our desire to just destroy infrastructure and hospitals and really not pay attention to the tremendous, not just the immediate cost, but the cost that stays for uh, decades and generations. And of course, then there's the other dimension that people know about, but again, continues to be a challenge. And that dimension is large scale agricultural production. This is a story from just a few months ago. Uh, this was on the cover of Economist, but China is not the only place, India and Brazil. Um, and Pakistan, and of course, farms in the United States. Uh, their enforcement and um, sort of uh, lax laws about use of antibiotics in feed um, continue to be a challenge. In places like Pakistan, places, a country that I grew up in, there is abject poverty and rapid urbanization that has created these sort of uh, uh, islands of, of poor hygiene where there is rampant uh, infection and rapid rise of uh, antimicrobial resistant organisms. There are places where, and this is a picture that I took myself, where in the feed antibiotics are just mixed by sort of in, in big bags um, and there's lack of regulation. But then there's also another tragedy. I took this picture um, from um, when I was in Northern Uganda at very, not, not very far from the South Sudanese border, uh, a place called Ajumani, uh, which has been housing South Sudanese refugees for decades. Uh, and there I asked the doctor about um, infections. And he told me that the antibiotics that the people get are the antibiotics that the clinic has, not the antibiotics that the people need. So we should think about sort of this, this notion of global equity and inequity. Who gets to have good treatment? Who gets to have the right antibiotic? Who gets to have the right uh, drug? And what are we doing about sort of this massive inequity that we're seeing over and over again in this country and elsewhere in the era of COVID as well? And I hope that we'll be able to reflect on that a little bit. I want to end with where we are now and, and sort of the last few chapters in the book talk about that as well. The reality is that we are not doing very well. Um, if you look at the data and the statistics, new antibiotics are hard to come to market. New antibiotics are oftentimes just sort of uh, minor changes in existing um, sort of uh, molecules and are not necessarily brand new uh, formulations. There are some activities going on, including one in Boston University led by Professor Kevin Alderson um, called Carbex. But in general, um, the number of drugs that are reaching the market is absolutely unacceptable. On, on, if you look at statistically, 2% uh, of drugs that enter phase one would get approval. Right now, there are 43 drugs that are in various stages. Applying the 2% rule means nothing that gets approved. Then there are other challenges as well. Companies are leaving antibiotics or anti-infectives in general towards non-communicable diseases because of business models that are far more lucrative and the lack of real robust business models to address that. Just to put uh, things in the perspective of um, sort of uh, revenue, um, Net present value is sort of uh, the difference between investments and returns in, in, in a very simplistic terms. Um, new antibiotics in general would cause you to lose money. Uh, in the best case or in the optimistic case, uh, where we want to be is in 100 million, but in general, it sort of really causes uh, massive losses. Compare that to oncology, central nervous system, musculoskeletal disorders, cardiovascular systems, immunomodulators. So that tells you that the system is broken. For some, for gram, some gram negatives, uh, we haven't had a new antibiotic since 1960s. In general, the last time we had any uh, sort of real uh, pipeline of antibiotics in the system was in the 1980s. So there's something really, really, really wrong. And there's a number of reasons. Investment is one part of that. Um, this may change with COVID, but if you were to ask, uh, colleagues in infectious disease hospitals in community health centers or in community hospitals, they would say, in general, they do not get many applicants. Good doctors, uh, residents were not interested in working in infectious diseases. Uh, in general, there was a lack of interest 
even in graduate school for people who wanted to work on antimicrobial resistance. New models in the public and private sector uh, sort of working together weren't coming to the market either. So really the system is broken at multiple levels and, and then efforts are being made, but it, it, it has some serious challenges that we need to overcome. I want to end with this question that I ask myself often and uh, people ask me as well. Um, is there reason to be hopeful? Uh, should we uh, think of a future where there is hope? And my answer to that is yes. But it only is possible if we cultivate and inculcate another trait in ourselves and that is of humility. Humility in several dimensions. Humility that science alone will not get us out of this. We will need to work with public health experts. We will need to work with economists, with governments, with diplomats, with people who understand human behavior, with social scientists and humanists. Humility that economics alone wouldn't do that. Humility that throwing money at the problem is not going to solve the problems until and unless we really address the, the, the structures in society where there is tremendous inequity. And humility that we all have to be in this together. Me first, my country first, my nation first is not going to solve the problem. So I'll end here. Um, and and I, I, I hope that there are many questions and, and points of discussion. I'll, I'll give it to Karen from here and I'll stop sharing my screen. Great, thank you so much. That was so interesting. Um, I guess maybe if you just start with with something very basic, which is what is at stake? What what are we what are we facing? What is the scope of the problem here? So, Karen, the scope of the problem um, is defined in different ways. If we look at raw numbers, there have been different studies. Some have been accepted more than others, but we are really looking at uh, tens of millions of people affected on a yearly basis. Does that mean 10 million people dying every year as one report uh, that has gotten a lot of attention uh, say so? Maybe, maybe not. But it means something very fundamental, which means that ordinary infections, ordinary uh, uh, sort of procedures can be really life-threatening. Think of C-section, think of sort of uh, routine elective surgery um, and, and things of that nature that can be really problematic. It also is, uh, very uh, important to recognize that people who are already struggling, people who may have to go to hospital multiple times because of pre-existing conditions uh, will really be facing this tremendous challenge because hospitals or health centers will become uh, more and more this hotbed of infection, right? I mean, we already know that hospitals want to sort of, uh, for lack of a better term, kick you out sooner than later, partly because there is this worry of developing infection. Um, even though they may make a lot more money by, by having individuals stay for a long period of time. So that's one, one dimension of that. Again, and, that, and then there's the dimension of sort of inequity that exists, uh, that people who already are struggling will have a much bigger impact on this. But then I think there are other issues that we have to think about. If we are really dealing with a situation where ordinary uh, health procedures become hard to uh, carry out, what does it mean about the entire health system? What does it mean about sort of... Uh, uh, people who really need the care that they, they, they get. And then, of course, the financial impact of that is phenomenal. You're talking about trillions of dollars in a place where economies are already struggling, right? So, so the impact, and, and I told this to somebody else the other day, that if I sort of throw in a number and say, well, 10 million people or a million people dying every day, every year, that certainly is, is very, very sad and, and, and horrifying, but to a certain level, we have gotten numb to these large statistics, right? We have uh, somehow uh, learned to live with these numbers, which is just a tragedy in its own right. Um, but, but so we really need to think about how does it affect uh, things that we take for granted. Uh, elective surgery is one of them. Uh, having a very high risk of infection, going to the dentist, and then it really becoming out of control. All of those things really sort of uh, uh, can become the norm in ways that it should not be acceptable. Right, right. Um, and looking at COVID um, specifically, we, we had a question and, and I had one too, which is how is COVID affecting antibiotic resistance 
And, uh, and one, one of the attendees wanted to know, um, they thought that the, the studies of COVID-19 deaths have found that the number of cases with bacterial infections is very, very low. So are, are we, on the one hand, I think one study found that 70% of patients in New York were getting antibiotics early on. So are we using them? And then is it helping in some way? So, so that's a great question. And the short answer is we don't have the data, uh, partly because we haven't collected it. There is some data that has come from China. There's some data that has come from Italy that has shown that there are um, cases of antimicrobial resistance. But you have to remember that the time scale of two things are different. If we are giving a lot of antibiotics right now, it is, it is likely that we'll see the effect of that much later. And the reason we know that is that the SARS uh, epidemic of early 2000s um, in places where excessive antibiotics were used in, in East Asia, particularly in Eastern part of China and in Hong Kong became uh, places where antibiotic resistance really rose up over time. So, so part of the challenge, and, and I think the reason we don't pay attention to it is because the, the so-called tsunami of antimicrobial resistance is on the slower side than how sort of governments take action. And that's the tragedy of it because it really reaches the point when you can't do anything anymore, but because it doesn't happen on as fast a level, then it really sort of starts to uh, make things uh, very difficult on that front. In the laboratories on an individual level, yeah, it may be, there may be, uh, I would say, uh, resistance that develops pretty fast, but at a population level, it tends to be much slower, and that's why uh, we don't uh, we don't prioritize it as much. The question about COVID is is an important one because, of course, people want to avoid any infections, and there's a lot of prophylactic um, antibiotics that are given. But I really have a lot of concerns about what might be happening in um, in, in due course. We do have some data saying that antimicrobial resistance is uh, sort of hasn't hasn't decreased by any means that you wouldn't expect, but it might also be increasing as I mentioned in Italy. But we do also have data from countries that uh, where you can buy antibiotics off uh, sort of over the counter, uh, that there is an increase in some cases of the use of antibiotics, which means that in due course, those antibiotics will become ineffective and, and hence you will have um, sort of a serious problem there. And just to be clear, SARS-CoV-2 is a virus, not a bacterium. So antibiotics are technically useless, right? I mean, or, or at some stage of the disease, could you could you need them? No, no, no. Um, well, I mean, if you develop bacterial infection, you can. But remember that if you are in a place where, um, let's, I, I'll give a very specific example of Pakistan, a country where I'm from. If you have a fever, you end up taking antibiotics because that just has become sort of the, the norm, uh, unacceptable by every uh, sort of... Uh, uh, reason on every every uh, sort, of, uh, sort of from every lens, but people take antibiotics as um, they would take Tylenol, right? Um, and and uh, that really sort of causes the problem. And if a large number of people start doing that, then what ends up happening, of course, is that the bacteria become resistant and it affects people. Then when you do take antibiotics, it doesn't do you any good. But uh, with sort of the the cough and the fever-like symptoms. The rye, the we don't we do have some data from Pakistan. Um, in this case, azithromycin, a commonly used antibiotic, uh, the the sales increased. Right, right. Yes, given with hydroxychloroquine, which is a whole other story. But um, one of our one of the uh, audience members wants to know if you could speak a little bit more about the root causes of this resistance. Is one failure to address resistance rooted in the fact that clinical research and the development of new antibiotics um, received a large portion of the overall research funding, uh, including prestige at the cost of social science, behavioral economic research, which receives less attention and spotlighting? I think that's a great question. Um, it's hard to really know uh, what is the, the breakdown, but I think in general, historically, we have not prioritized aspects. And I'm saying that as somebody who has a research lab and works in, in sort of uh, the STEM discipline, so to speak, but I think the, this, this, is, this is absolutely true. The fact that you, uh, we have not uh, looked at the, the behavioral aspects of that. We have not looked at the social science aspects of that. I'll give you a very specific example, Karen. Um, I talked to a, a farmer in, in, uh, in South Asia, in Bangladesh, and um, we had a conversation. He's just a delightful person. 
And I, I asked him, why does he use uh, antibiotics in the feed? And he said that, uh, well, because he knows that by using antibiotics, he can have his uh, cattle grow faster. And then there are very clear economic incentives. And if I don't want him to do that, what is his alternative? Why shouldn't he do that, right? So uh, you cannot just force people that and tell them that, oh, you're a bad person while using antibiotics. When he sees, and, and he was a humble man with a very sort of a modest um, place where he worked in. And he said that this is the first time in his family's long history where he has been able to make ends meet. Mm-hmm. And, and antibiotics are playing a role here. And if I'm telling him for, for him to stop doing that and, and lose the little profit that he makes, uh, what alternative do I give, right? So we have to understand this, and this has been a, a learning experience for me writing this book of the human and the humane aspects of this. We cannot sort of uh, impose policy on an individual without really understanding their motives of doing that. Not everybody is driven by sort of hubris and greed, sometimes they are doing it because that's the best choice they can make. And we have to understand that. And I'm certainly not defending the use of antibiotics in the animal sector, not at all. But I'm saying that somebody who sees a clear benefit and and is for the first time in several generations is having any semblance of a decent life, we need to give them some alternatives and need to have policies that allow them to maintain that dignity and still work in a way that is right in the public health sector. So, so I think that was a great question. I think we need to do more on that, absolutely. Can science solve that problem? Can you figure out how to fatten up his cattle without antibiotics? Well, so, so the good thing now is that there is data that shows that at a certain point, the, the use of antibiotics really doesn't do much. So that is true, actually. However, uh, early on, for example, in this case in Bangladesh, there may still be an advantage. So. Um, the way to do that is if he's able to sell his non-antibiotic uh, fed cow at the same price, right? So there's the, the, the amount of uh, feed that he has to use or whatever else. And, and some people have done that. So for example, in Thailand, when I was talking to the people there, uh, because there was a demand for antibiotic free uh, shrimp or fish uh, in Europe, the farmer stopped using it because they could sell it at a higher price and were able to still make the ends meet. And I think that's an important lesson of of the market failure. So the question that our colleague asked um, is not only look at the science of this, but also uh, uh, look at the the, the economics of this or the social science of this or the behavioral aspect of this, which I think is absolutely important there. Yeah, a a related question, maybe you answered this already. I was wondering how much of an effect factory farming has had on antibiotic resistance. And if there's negative effects, what's being done? So I guess you- Tremendous. Um, So New York Times had a story, a series of stories in last summer um, showing the the tremendous, tremendous impact of this large scale agriculture, large scale uh, sort of uh, animal husbandry. Greening disease, I don't know if anybody here is from Florida, from citrus growing regions, is something that really affects a lot of citrus plants. And to prevent greening disease, for the longest time, they were using streptomycin, a drug that was used for TB. So, so, so just think about sort of the, the use for that, and it actually doesn't even work that well. But the point is that that, that, that sort of system still is there. Uh, um, and, and uh, it has had a tremendous impact in the in the United States and, and some of the other parts of the world. Um, farming sector uses more antibiotics by by weightage or tonnage than the human clinical sector does, and and that tells you something about uh, the demand side of the equation. So so part of the argument that we have to change here is not just the supply side of the equation, but also the demand side of the equation, um, and 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 whether our uh, reliance on a certain meat-based diet or certain expectations of how much meat we should have and all of those things um, has feeds into this whole problem. It does seem like at least some companies are getting that message, though. I feel like maybe it's McDonald's. I'm sorry, I can't remember. Um, but some of the big 
companies have moved away from antibiotics? So that's a great question um, as well. So what ended up happening in early 2000, <clears throat> so there was a, a there was a sort of a group that really uh, was arguing, came, coming out of Tufts University, led by uh, late Professor Stuart Levy, who was sort of really pioneering this idea of rational use of antibiotics. And that is, is the right idea. So I'm not one who would say that if an animal gets sick with a, with a bacterial infection, you should never use antibiotics. It's more about the rational use of antibiotics because I think that, it's, that would be just absolutely unethical to let the animal die because, and, and you had the, the drug to treat it. So, so the rational use is the argument. And among the champions of that uh, rational use was a corporation that we often don't associate with, um, let's say, the best public health decisions, and that was McDonald's Corporation. They said that they will stop using any meat that uses antibiotics that are important for human consumption. Now, they haven't gone far enough, in my opinion, but the fact is that they are still saying that more than um, um, others. And, and I'm, I, I, I have differences with McDonald's in terms of their business policies, their wages, their um, sort of uh, the quality of their, their, their uh, beverages and things like that. But here they were actually the first large corporation in the fast food industry that said, no, we will not use that. So, so I think that message is, is getting there, but so is the other side of the message. So um, you would find um, ads, there was a recent ad, uh, almost uh, really sort of blatantly sexist where they showed a, a woman with, with a baby um, who was really tired and, and, and the message was, well, uh, you know, we know that you're overworked, have a glass of wine and chicken, whether or not it uses antibiotics, it's safe to eat, right? So, so these kind of subliminal messages, uh, and it was largely run on social media, but, but there's the other side as well. Um, so you have pharmaceutical companies, you have large agricultural uh, sort of uh, lobbies and, and companies, um, and you have sort of this, this strange nexus uh, of, of uh, groups that would argue that we need to have lax laws to the point that when WHO came with a stronger, it wasn't very, very strong, but at least stronger than, than prior commitments on the use of antibiotics in the agriculture sector, US simply refused it. They said that we are not going to uh, use that. In many ways, it goes back to Sandro's point early on that if anything, that was um, perhaps a, a little trailer of how US engages with WHO and its messaging. Right. Uh, that's a good segue to the next question. Um, the political ramifications of changes to public health approaches can't be ignored. Um, could you talk about that, especially the impact for the U.S.? So between China, India, and U.S., you are dealing with sort of large, large uh, agricultural sectors. Um, and here I mean both uh, sort of um, farming um, animals and, 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 uh, and grains and the other agricultural aspects of that. Um, you also have large uh, sort of areas um, in the country that are um, so-called breadbasket of, of the country, um, where uh, sort of the farming uh, community is very, very strong, right? So there are political ramifications. And as, as somebody who may hold certain political views, I also recognize that I don't want to come off as dismissive to anybody's opinions, right? For me, uh, when I said at the end that uh, the hope comes from humility, uh, that I, I need a good dose of humility for myself as well. I think the solution is going to come, as I said, by providing alternatives as well. So you can't really sort of change things uh, in a way that is going to be, let's say, very heavy handed because that is not going to work. You have to build consensus that there is a public health cost, a current cost that is just perhaps too big for us to really engage with. And here are the alternatives. Here's the data. We know, we know at least from the climate change debate, that data always doesn't work. You can have strong data and people may still disagree. So you really have to have a political process based on understanding and trying to work out. Um, this is not going to happen overnight as much as I would like for it to. Um, but I think what will happen is you really have to sort of have a long standing partnership of trust and saying, look, we recognize that we don't want to destroy your business. We recognize that this is something that these communities have 
always done for, for as long as we can imagine. But this is also a public health challenge. So let's figure out a way that works. That may mean from economics perspective, different kinds of subsidies, that may mean different kinds of incentives, but there should be a very clear message. And I think that just hasn't happened. The other dimension of political, uh, which has become unfortunately um, the, the typical rhetoric in, in politics these days is, um, is just toxicity. So, so the fact that WHO says something, it is ignored because it, they're, they're globalists, they're internationalists, whatever. Um, and, and that's very unfortunate because that takes away any reasonable conversation um, or the idea that any conversation can happen whatsoever. So I think, I think that, as I, as I talk about in the book, this greater rise in nationalism is, is, is a tremendous threat to the public health systems everywhere and certainly on the issues of antimicrobial resistance. Right. Um, you talked about other factors that can contribute to antibiotic resistance like war and, and social unrest. How plausible can it be to curb or make the world understand that such things um, can, can make, it, it's not an obvious connection that, that most people make. So how can you kind of make so that? That, you know, um, that was the hardest part of, of writing and, and learning about going to these communities that have been in the crosshairs of conflict for a long, long period. And and hearing the, their their stories and talking to them, uh, I did uh, a bit of that in, in in Lebanon, and certainly uh, spoke to a lot of people. Even though I didn't travel to Yemen, I spoke to a lot of people there in Afghanistan, and and that was just absolutely uh, absolutely tragic and devastating. Um, and that connection, unfortunately, uh, has not been met uh, made in uh, sort of public discourse as it needs to. Um, in the academic literature, there's, there's plenty of that. Um, there's something called ecology of war. Uh, many people are writing about it, um, but, but that conversation has remained in the academic circles. And that's part of the reason I wanted to write this book was to really bring some of these things that have been in specialized journals and not as much. How do we do that? Well, so the, the place where I found people willing to listen of all the places and places that, are, that historically has not been my, my favorite place has been in uh, the military command. I don't agree with many of the decisions that they have made. That has nothing to do with the respect of individual sort of uh, servicemen and service women, but many of the policies are things that I do not agree with. And, and, and they know that. But there was an appetite to understand the impact of uh, this. And that's a, that's a tough conversation to have, uh, Karen. But I think one has to engage in that conversation. One has to say that, look, wars are, are not the solution. Wars are not uh, the right approach. And in addition to my sort of revulsion to war and, 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 and sort of the human cost of this, this is the public health cost that affects all of us, that affects the, the servicemen and women, that affects the communities, that affects their families, that affects soldiers there, that affects their soldiers and ours, and, and, and nobody gets to win. Um, and you know, um, Joanne Liu, who was the, the immediate past president of, uh, of uh, MSF, at Doctors Without Borders, really sort of uh, made this a, a major part of her conversation that uh, conflict and wars are not going to solve any problems. And they not only they create problems which are of social unrest and, and inequity, but they're health problems that affect everybody, including those who start those wars. And we really need to think about that. So, so that's something that I, in my research, have sort of purposefully started to look at health in, in, in places that are in, uh, in conflict. So looking at community, refugee communities and internally displaced people. Uh, but yeah, I mean, that's, um, that, that continues to be a challenge. And climate change is probably only going to exacerbate that? Absolutely. So I think, I think um, the challenge with climate change is also twofold. So, of course, you have communities that are displaced, uh, right? You also have social unrest. You also have refugees. Um, you also have people who are now living in, in, in places where they're confined and, and hygiene issues are a problem. So that's something that we, we know uh, is going to, I mean, any, any, any time you have those challenges, those places become sort of the breeding grounds of drug resistant infection. So we know that. Um, that's one thing. Uh, that climate change is affecting. But then there are other aspects of this as well, because there was a whole ecosystem in which people lived, right? So there was an interaction with animals and humans and, 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 and sort of their lands in which they cultivated 
all of that is going to change. And it, what it does is this sort of rapid urbanization creates these problems. The hospitals are not ready and equipped to deal with infections. The hospitals, many of them have never had these kinds of infections. People are living in, in tighter spaces. So you have uh, all kinds of health challenges. So I think, I think climate change is going to be an issue that is um, going to be affecting directly. I haven't seen any reports of the, the link between climate change and uh, and a microbial resistance in a direct link, but many of the, the drivers of uh, people living in, in closed and confined spaces, people having to live in places where hygiene um, is a problem, uh, increase in infections, those are all sort of in, in, in many ways linked together and hence can be, a, can be a challenge. Right, and zoonotic diseases that come- Absolutely, absolutely. Go absolutely. more in nature, we become more exposed. Mm -hmm. Pulling back a little bit, um, somebody would like you to clarify the difference between an individual's resistance to antibiotics versus community resistance or more global resistance. Is it true that if an individual takes antibiotics inappropriately, that that person may become antibiotic resistant? Um, so so uh, let's take a step back here. That's a good question. I'm glad somebody asked that. The person is not resistant. What is resistant is the bug. Okay, so it's the bacteria that is resistant, right? So, so when somebody, and we often sort of use this term broadly uh, of antibiotic resistance, assuming that the person is resistant. So this is a different situation than, than uh, thinking a person is sick, right? This is actually the, the resistant, the resistance is developed in the bacteria that you're trying to kill. So that's the first point of clarity. Now, what happens when uh, you would take an antibiotic um, and you would sort of kill some of the bacteria and not all of the bacteria, right? So you have some of the bacteria that were already stubborn and, and harder to kill. Now, those are the ones that are going to be the ones that are dominating, right? So, and hence the next time you would take that antibiotic, well, it's not going to work as well. And it goes on until you don't have any potency left. Now, how would this develop in a community? Well, it can develop in a community because that sort of bacteria goes and becomes sort of endemic in, in the waterways, in the, in the environment, or you would get that infection from somebody else, right? So that's why you have these quarantine facilities with people who are uh, in, in, uh, in infectious diseases and TB where it can really affect somebody else as well, right? So, so there's, a, there's that transition, transmission angle, but then there's this angle uh, that goes in the environment. And then there's this other thing where one species of bacteria can share its DNA packet or DNA cassette with another species and make it what is called a superbug. So there you can think about, um, by the way, that term comes from the 1960s. Um, there you can think about uh, the challenge, for example, that happened again uh, with uh, multi-drug resistant, or in this case, XDR, extensively drug resistant typhoid, where uh, sort of some of the genetic elements from E. coli got into the uh, into the uh, bacterial cell uh, that causes typhoid, salmonella typhi, and created sort of these typhoid bacteria or ty typhoid bugs that were not responding to any drug. So they were already not responding. They also got something from E. coli and they sort of brought in that additional resistance arsenal. So, and, and if that is in the community, it's in the waterways, it's in the environment, then multiple people are affected. Could it be started by one person? Of course. But so, so you have to really know that it's the bacteria that is resistant, not the person. And that sort of, um, I would say, delineation, that separation is important for us to understand. Right, is there also individual variation where, you know, I had a lot of antibiotics when I was a kid. Um, and so maybe I'll have more issues later on uh, as I get older versus somebody else? So, so that's a great, great question as well. And that's where I think we need more science because there are, uh, your immune system uh, reacts differently to uh, than mine, than, than even the person sitting next to you. And that sort of, uh, that's why it's important not to paint the whole thing with very broad brush strokes because the, and that's why it's important to recognize that what I see in a petri dish in the lab may or may not happen in my gut. So, so, uh, because of your genetic makeup, because of your immunity, because of the nutrition, whatever, um, you may respond differently um, uh, or, or may uh, have uh, to a resistant infection than another. But one can say that once the resistance 
uh, spreads by sort of a broad exposure to antimicrobial resistant pathogens, then the risk is high. And of course, the highest in people who are vulnerable. And are there any treatments that sort of, or could we shift our focus? There's a lot of emphasis now on immune therapy. Is there a way to kind of boost our immune systems to fight off in, instead of antibiotics? So I, I'm, I'm not a nutritionist or um, um, a physician. So I, I'll defer to my, my colleagues who deal with that. But I'll tell you a little interesting bit. Um, if you go to the supermarket, whichever one happens to be in your neighborhood and, and the one that you go to, you'll find uh, probiotic uh, yogurt uh, that wouldn't have been there 20 years ago. Uh, so what, what exactly is, is the claim there? And I'll, and I'll be very cautious in, in, in saying it's a claim. That is, it allows for the good bacteria to be there. Now, the claim may be true or not, but the underlying sort of suggestion is an important one that uh, we, is for, so in the 1960s and to a certain extent, in the, even in the 1970s, it was war on bacteria, right? So all bacteria are bad, just kill all bacteria. And we realized um, that actually that's not only misleading, that's actually super dangerous because uh, your immune system, your digestion, your um, sort of um, in, in kids, their growth depends on this uh, ability of, of uh, their system to have good bacteria on them. There's a very good book by uh, Ed Jong called I Contain Multitudes. And that really talks about some of this sort of diversity of bacteria uh, that, that are there, including the ones that are in our immune system, in our gut and all of that. So I think it's important to recognize that we absolutely want to boost immune systems, but it comes from that idea that there are good bacteria that we absolutely, absolutely need. Now, whether a particular brand of yogurt or a particular herbal remedy does that, I do not know. But but that idea itself is an important one. Right. So bo boosting uh, boosting our diversity or maintaining our diversity through... Yeah, absolutely. Um, and do you see, moving to sort of a solution focus here, you said throwing money at the problem is not the answer, although some people have said that if the government could incentivize uh, development antibiotic development, that that would be helpful. Is science going to get us out of this? What, what, what can we, where so can my we? Answer, my answer to be honest, um, Karen, is, is all of the above. I think we do need more resources, but you cannot sort of just throw money at this in, in some kind of a, a, a shotgun approach. Um, rather, what you need to do is to understand the drivers. And part of the reason I wrote the book the way I wrote it um, is because I believe that by recognizing how we got here uh, can tell us how we'll get out of this, right? So um, it is a combination of hubris. It's a combination of wars. It's a combination of not paying attention to good science. It's a combination in belief that there'll always be a drug out there. It's a combination of nationalism that gets us here and, and sort of undoing those kinds of things to the best of our ability will allow us to sort of change that. Right, so, so um, imagining that there'll always be a drug out there, well, we know that's not true. So, well, how do we solve that? Thinking that uh, we can use any antibiotics in the animal sector as long as they're not used in the human sector is fine. Well, we know that's not true. So we'll have to re redo some of that things. My sense is that we really need uh, good science and discovery. I think that's that goes without saying, uh, but we also need behavioral understanding. We also need a good economic models. We also need to recognize that all of us are in this together. I spoke to people in Sierra Leone and in, in Cote d'Ivoire and in Bangladesh and in Vietnam. And I mean, WHO can say all they want. And here's my criticism of WHO. I certainly do not agree with the current administrative uh, approach towards WHO, but WHO or UN agencies can say all they want, but the person on the ground is really not seeing those things. Those are still bureaucratic and very high level. Um, over the last couple of years, uh, my colleague at the School of Public Health, Veronica Woods and I have looked at national action plans and they sound great, but if you ask a person what the national action plan against antimicrobial resistance is, even in the government, many of them would have no idea. So we need to understand how people who are really uh, affected 
are 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 going to are going to see this and 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 understand that. So science is part of that. Engineering is part of that. One of the things that we didn't talk about today because of um, I didn't have the time was the engineering questions that come in this. We do not have in low and middle income countries, Karen, an ability to quickly diagnose at the point of care whether your fever is viral or bacterial. And that continues to be a big, big question, right? So uh, if you're able to do that, otherwise what happens is that the pharmacist says, well, go and take this um, antibiotic. Um, here too, it does not just low and middle income countries. It happens in, in, in the physician's office here. Um, so we do not have that, right? We have to culture and we have to send it to the lab to be able to do that in five or 10 minutes. That's an engineering question. So, so we need to solve those kinds of things as well, just as we need to find some of these other things. Um, I guess we're, we're actually running out of time. Um, so the last question, uh, one of our viewers wants to know about how writing this book has affected your future academic pursuits and projects you're excited about. What, what's next for you? So that, that, that's, that's a great question. You know, it, it, has, it has changed my life in, in so many ways. Uh, the first one is that it has given me this remarkable opportunity to see people I wouldn't have met otherwise. Um, to go to places um, in far corners of the world, to see the world, to be, to be uh, awed and, and humbled by how wonderful these incredible, incredible people are. And I want to continue with that. I think life is short and I want to learn from these incredible people in, in far corners of the world. Uh, it has also given me an opportunity to reflect upon my own research and what it means, what my sense of responsibility is for people around me. And I certainly make no claims that uh, I can sort of, sort of shape or change their lives, but I can be a part of the conversation that I think is important. Uh, I hope that my academic pursuits will continue um, at the interface of science, um, public health, but also public engagement in a way that first of all, transforms my own understanding. And secondly, will hopefully contribute towards a, a more healthy and a more equitable future. And I think in this day and age, when we live, in a, a greatly unequal society, uh, whatever we can contribute towards uh, equity in whatever domain, uh, I, I hope that we are all able to do that. And I hope that my writing will be a part of that, um, that process. Great, thanks so much. And uh, passing it back to, to the Dean for some final comments. Well, first of all, um, thank you, Karen, for a fantastic uh, moderation for taking uh, everybody's questions. Um, uh, thank you to everybody who put in questions and who participated in the conversation. And of course, thank you, Mohammed, for writing the book and for uh, honoring us with this conversation. Uh, you know, I will end on the uh, last thing that Mohammed you said, which is um, life is short and uh, you hope to continue learning. Uh, I, um, I think it's such an extraordinary privilege to be working within an academic environment where one can continue learning and one can continue learning as a, on a day to day basis and to have conversations like this. So really, thank you to both of you. I have learned so much from you for the past hour. Thank you to all our audience who joined us for these conversations. And uh, thank you to everybody for everything they do every day for the public's health. Everybody have a good evening. Stay well.